Hi gang, uh, Dr. Ken Nordberg here again. <laughs> Been a little while since I talked to you. Uh, in the next coming days I've got a few new things I'd like to teach you. Uh, specific hunting methods like the last one about uh, using a, a portable stool for stand hunting. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about another really effective way to hunt whitetails. And the reason it's effective is because uh, Using this hunting method is a way of, of uh, countering the whitetail's ability to use your sense, your airborne sense and your trail sense to avoid you. You know, that's something we can't, whitetails have noses that are 10,000 times more sensitive than human noses. And the kind of things they smell that from us and our trails, we can't smell or very little, unless we make a concerted effort, like, oh yeah, underarm, you know, something like that. Uh, but we normally don't pay attention to that smells we produce, but whitetails pay a lot of attention to them. And from our airborne orders, they can, they can detect what you are, and even what you're doing, okay, which is an important thing to know, because this hunting method I'm going to talk to you about uh, makes it possible to fool them or to use their sense of smell to our own advantage. There aren't many hunting methods that allow you to do that. And you'll understand what I'm talking about when we get going on this. Uh, this is particularly effective when hunting older deer. It's very effective for hunting dominant breeding bucks. Over the last 25 years, my sons and I have taken quite a few big, big dominant breeding bucks by using this very technique. I call it the gentle nudge for a good reason, which you'll understand a little bit here. But anyway, this is a hunting method that has everything to do with the whitetail's ability to smell humans and react accordingly. And there's a few things, tips in here that you've probably never heard of before that are really important, not only to using this hunting method, but all hunting methods. So let's get, let's get down to brass tacks on this. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I'm using one advantage. Uh, we've taken, like I say, we've taken quite a few bucks, nice bucks, bucks that are on the wall, uh, using this hunting method. And uh, we don't use it every day. It's not an everyday kind of thing, and you'll understand why we don't use it every day. But anyway, uh, I took one of the hunts that was successful. Uh, my youngest daughter, <laughs> taking a trophy class buck, her first one, while we're using this method. And it's a good, it's a good example of this kind of a hunting method. Uh, and like I said, I call it the gentle nudge. Now, one day several years ago, um, it was during the week, uh, my sons were all in college and they had jobs to take care of them. And during the week, uh, they weren't with me. I was all alone in camp. But my youngest daughter, I knew, was going to come up and hunt with me a couple days during that period. And uh, that evening, when I was heading back to camp, it was getting dark, almost completely dark. Uh, on the way back to camp, from north of camp, I came across some very fresh tracks of two deer. A, a doe, obviously in heat, uh, you'll find out why I knew it was obviously in heat and a big dominant breeding buck. The buck tracks were about four inches long. That's a nice buck. Uh, anytime you, you take a buck with four inch hoof prints, uh, you're probably going to put it on the wall. And uh, the two deer were together and, uh, and uh, they had crossed the trail I was using to go to and from a distant stand site. And uh, really fresh. And the tracks were heading towards a feeding area and a feeding area where we've taken deer before, and it's, it's full of red osiers or osiers or red bark dogwood, dogwoods are another name for them. It's a favorite winter browse plant of, of uh, northern Minnesota whitetails, and, and actually whitetails anywhere all the way to Maine. Uh, anyway, uh, so I knew we had a doe and estrus because when the buck, the buck's tracks were being dragged or his hoofs were being dragged from track to track. And when you find tracks like that where the buck is dragging his feet through the snow 
and uh, you see the marks of his hoofs going from track to track. It means that buck is under the influence of doe and estrus pheromone. And when, when they, that pheromone hits them, <laughs> uh, they do lots of things, but one of the things they do is kind of walk stiff-legged for some strange reason. And because they walk stiff-legged, they make the, this peculiar track where they're dragging hoofs from track to track in the snow. And what, or, early, many years ago, my boys started calling them railroad tracks, and to this day in our camp, we call them railroad tracks. And any time we find railroad tracks, with or without a doe, no, that buck is smelling doe and estrus pheromone, and a doe that's in heat right now. So anyway, I found these tracks. That's kind of exciting. If I, for two reasons. For one, I knew the buck was with a doe in heat, and he's going to stay with her. Well, they, the does are in heat for anywhere in the United States for only a period of 24 to 6 hours each doe during the two-week period that does are in heat. And so I knew that the buck wasn't going to be with her more than 24 hours. Now, I didn't know when that doe began in heat, but it certainly was with, her, with, that, with that doe right at this moment. And I knew that if I was going to have a chance to take that big buck, I'd have to do it very quickly. You know, like, well, it's dark now, so how about tomorrow morning? At least by tomorrow morning. We have to get after this buck. And where would I be looking for? In that very same feeding area with that doe. That, that doe, that buck is going to stay with her in its bedding area while the doe isn't hit, and it's going to be with her when she's feeding when that doe isn't hit. So this is a dynamite set of tracks to find any time while you're deer hunting. The only thing is, you know, you got to be able to take advantage of it now. If you're stuck with a tree stand somewhere and you you don't hunt the, where you know that buck and doe is going to be tomorrow morning. What are you going to do about it? Well, what we, we can use portable stools a lot, and especially when we find this kind of thing, because we have to be able to hunt in certain spots to take advantage of this information. So anyway, I got back to camp, and here was Kate there. I, I could see smoke coming out of our smokestack, out of our uh, coming out of our big wall tent, so I, I knew she was there before I even got close, and I got there and there was a car parked outside of the tent, and she was happy to see me, and I gave her a big hug, and then I, the next thing I said, tomorrow morning you're going to get a big buck, <laughs> and she, she said, oh, just like that, <laughs> she's done it enough times to know that this is not an everyday occurrence, but I, I was just so sure after finding those tracks and knowing where those deer were going to be feeding in the morning, she's going to get that big buck if we do things right. And that's what the gentle nudge is all about. So let me show you this diagram here. I made this kind of a rough picture of, of, of a gentle nudge. In this case, when I came out of the woods, I was traveling south on this trail here. Trail, old, an old deer trail that used to get to some distant stand sites north of there. And we use this as a major trail to start with, and then we go to stand site approach trails along that trail that, that branch off. So I was heading back to camp along that trail, and and over here on this side is an, of a beaver pond, a big beaver dam there, and the, the deer had come up from the beaver pond. It was frozen. Maybe they were looking for water there, but they had come out of the woods along this side. It's all wooded area here, by the way, but. They had come out of that area and crossed my trail going in the direction of this feeding area. This feeding area is a low spot at the end of a uh, thickly wooded spruce bog. And spruce bogs are wet. There's little pools of water here and there. It's kind of wet and so thick that you could walk in there and you wouldn't be able to see a deer if it was more than about 10 yards away from you. It's that heavy in there. But the thing about a spruce bog, this one in particular is a favorite escape area of, of big bucks and other deer. If they need to hide quick, boy, they bound into a place like that and they're safe there because you can't get close enough to, to get a shot by walking in there and trailing them. They're always going to hear you coming and or smell you and, and be able to keep away from you. So that's an escape area. Now, 
thing about an escape area, it plays an important area wherever you, uh, uh, it's an important element wherever you hunt whitetails. Uh, in this case, let's say we decided, you know, and, and a lot of hunters that did thought, well, if I told, well, tomorrow morning is going to be a big buck, a dominant buck, a breeding buck, with a doe and asterisk, the first thing they had to be saying, well, we should make a little drive here. And uh, let's say we'll, we'll have somebody go sit downwind of that feeding area, and then a couple of us, let's go up on the north side here, or, or south side, because the wind was going to be blowing from the south in the morning, which it was. It was a light breeze. Well, let's get up on the north side, and then we'll drive that buck down to somebody sitting down there. Well, I'll tell you, I guarantee you what would have happened is, once those deer smelled you and heard you coming, from the south, they would make a beeline into that spruce barn. And not only would that have ruined your chance to take that buck that day, but that buck would be gone for the rest of the hunting season. Anytime you make a big buck, raise his tail and bound away, he's gone for the season. He abandons the range or becomes completely nocturnal. So after that, it's impossible to take that deer. So by pushing, there is no whitetail anywhere in North America that hates to be, except maybe fawns and yearlings, they don't know that yet, but to hate to be pushed by a human in any direction very far because they're expecting an ambush ahead. They've learned, they've been hunted by us in this country for us uh, European <laughs> originating people for uh, over 300 years. And during that time, They've sure a lot, no, learned a lot by what us millions of whitetail hunters do when we're hunting in the fall. So they expect an ambush head. You know, hunters use, a lot of hunters use drives to get deer, and they're driving them to downwind hunters. Well, most deer, and especially older bucks, uh, not only do they know that if they're caught in a, situation, in a situation like that, it's very dangerous, but they know lots of ways to avoid it becoming victims of hunters making drives. Uh, laying down and cover between oncoming drivers, easy to figure out where they're in between. Uh, oncoming drivers until the driver's back, or outflanking the drivers, going one side or the other until they can't smell any drivers coming or hear them coming anymore, so then they can go back in the other direction into the wind so they can detect any hunters that are ahead and avoid an ambush. Or, uh, they uh, uh, they could clear out of the area before the drive even starts, and a lot of big bucks know how to do that. They can sense right away by sounds of hunters and talking and, and all these footsteps and hunters walking over this way and hunters walking down and over that way. A drive is going to start pretty soon, so they get the heck out of the area before the drive even begins. So that's your three favorite ways to avoid being taken by hunters taking drives. So, one thing I know I ever even thought of trying to make a dive, we're going to use the gentle nudge, and this works. So, anyway, the next morning, I, uh, we got it all set, and Katie uh, uh, all set to go, and we, I led her along this same trail, and when we went out there, right in about the same area, we found some new fresh tracks of the same buck with the doe heading toward that feeding area. That's pretty exciting. He's there, there right now. You know, this is going to work good. So we stayed way away from the feeding area. You don't want to get really close to that feeding area until you've got you're in the right position. So we're quite a long ways from here, maybe three to four hundred yards away, quite a ways away. And and we're and we're going downwind. You know, the wind is from the south, and it doesn't matter what smells is up here, but those deer aren't going to smell us. They're not going to smell anybody until I get to a certain place. But anyway, I led her all the way around. We went way up to a deer trail that goes in north in this direction. It splits up here. At this point, the split's about uh, 200 yards away. 200 yards away is a good way, a good distance to be away from the area where you know a big dominant buck is with a doe and estrus. Because if they did smell you, uh, if you're 200 yards or more away, they pretty much ignore you. 
oh, you're far enough away, we don't have to worry about that human, no matter what they're doing, uh, because there's plenty of time here to get away if we need to, and they probably won't even think about trying to get away until you're less than 100 yards away. So 200 yards here, it's, it's a safe distance in getting to stand sites, uh, at important stand sites while setting up a gentle nudge. So anyway, a letter, and we went through here, and right here, uh, there's a, a major deer trail going north out of this feeding area. Uh, all, of, every, all the years I've hunted there, 28 years now, we always find plenty of use of that trail coming out of this favorite feeding area. It's a real favorite of the deer in this country, in this area, in a square mile. <laughs> anyway, uh, so what I, that being the major trail, I decided Kate should be close to that major trail. It turns out there's a big hollow stump, You're big enough for Katie to sit on on her stool, her portable stool, her portable stump, in that, in that, uh, in that stump there, tw only 25 miles off, or 25 miles, 25 yards off that trail. And you'll see a picture of this here. Here it is. Well, anyway, here we are. I got Katie there, and we're we're about 100 yards north of this edge of the feeding area at this point. And I told Kate, now, you keep your eyes on the trail, I whispered, keep your eyes on the trail here. Uh, it's a big buck, so don't shoot anything but a big buck. <laughs> you might see other deer, but don't shoot anything but a big buck. And I said, it might be late, it might be as late as 10 o'clock before they're done feeding and decide what to do at that point. So be patient, but uh, sit still on this stump, you know, don't bring up your rifle with any deer looking toward you or any deer that have at least one eye that's visible to you. Uh, you want it to be behind some trees, maybe, you know, evergreens up in that area before you bring up your gun up. You might have to get it up early because it's kind of open, a little brushy in that area around her, but still, uh, don't let them see you move. She's wearing her camel head net like we always do, and dark gloves on her hands, and she was sitting in a special thing to help keep her warm. Nice cold day that day. But anyway, uh, so I got her all set up in the stump, and then started back. I retraced my step, went back, then I got to another deer trail down here in this area, and it kind of curves around a little bit. But again, 200 yards at least, uh, south of that feeding area. So I figure when I pass here, any deer that smell me downwind, and they certainly would, they, they would ignore me. Nothing to worry about. So I kept going here, and the trail makes a little jog here. And then when I got to the area of the jog, I started back toward the place I wanted to sit about 100 yards upwind of this edge of the feeding area. And I had a spot in mind, there was, I found a great big antler rub there one time and actually sat under a, a balsam tree there with this big rub on the trunk. So I headed back to that and I got to that spot. Now, the reason I wanted to come in at an angle like this is that when I did this, and I'm about 100 yards away, those deer would smell me. Oh, there's a hunter and he's moving. Well. They could tell I, what direction I'm moving because they'll, they'll sit there and smell like this and gee, it, here, they get a faint odor, you know, because I'm upwind and then it gets strong, you know, directly upwind, that's the strongest part, and then it gets weak again, well it means that the hunter is moving this way. If it, if it was only coming from one strong source and it was getting stronger, they'd know I'm coming right toward them. Now, they wouldn't like that. Boy, they would be on guard, they'd be watching and listening, and when there's certain is get coming this way, all right, they'd get out of there. And where would they go? There. Because they were escaping from the hunter. So, making a drive is a big mistake, but doing it this way is not a big mistake. So, there's, they get a whiff of me, and so they, they check on that odor and what it's doing, and oh, he's going for from left to right. It's not coming toward us. That's kind of important. It can't be going directly downwind to this 
spot here from upwind. You want to be going in sideways, east to west or whatever. So when they smell me, first smell me, I'm moving this way. The first smell me within 200 yards. I'm going this way. And then I stop. Now, it won't take them long to figure out I stop. Because, yeah, they go over this way, it gets a little faint. Over this way, it gets a little faint. And the strongest part is right here. And it's not getting stronger. And it's not getting weaker. It means he stopped. He's now a stand hunter. Now, nowadays, you know, after, well, stand hunting became popular beginning in the mid-1980s. And since that time, how many million hunters have been stand hunting? Maybe 10 million, at least. There isn't a white tail left in this country that doesn't recognize when somebody's stand hunting by odors alone, just by uh, checking out the odors that are carried by the air, the airborne odors, the hunter. And when they realize, gee, that hunter's not moving, that's a stand hunter. And stand hunters, they don't mind them at all, as long as they keep a safe distance, like say 100 yards or more. That's pretty safe distance anywhere, except in wide open areas, you know, prairie areas. They might want to be a lot further away than that away. But in wooded country, that's plenty safe. So I come in, I sat down. Well, yeah, there's a hunter over there, but we don't need to worry about him. He's sitting over there a good distance away, safe distance away, nothing to worry about. So I'm pretty soon they're back to feeding. Well. So while I'm sitting here, what's happening? What's happening to my orders? Human orders just don't go in a straight line somewhere. They spread, airborne orders spread over a fan-shaped area. If there's a strong wind behind you, it might be, it might go a mile. You know, good strong odors all along the ground, like whether you're on the ground or up the tree. Human orders, most human orders drop toward the ground. And that's why, that's what, causes trail sense to be made. The human odors falling to the ground make trails a stronger band of strong odors made by a human. But anyway, the airborne odors are spreading out in a fan-shaped area, triangular-shaped. And the odor, the breeze was light that day, so it would be fanning maximally, real wide. Uh, 100 yards downwind, uh, that would be to this edge here, but 200 yards downwind, that would cover an area 200 yards wide, approximately. And so what I've made then is a fence line of human scent. And the deer know I'm there, they know I'm, I'm, I'm not moving, but my odor is going way over here and way over here. Strongest in the middle, but very detectable by whitetails all the way out in this fan-shaped area. And it's constant. Well, the deer said, wow, we don't have to worry about that hill. He's the, just the stand hunter. <laughs> they don't, stand hunters don't chase deer. Or they, they just sit there. <laughs> and all they have to do is keep 100 yards away and we're fine. So they fed in there and they took their time. And, and as usual, uh, you know, whitetails usually get to their feeding areas by not long after 4 in the morning. They get out of bed and they head out early. And half the feeding time in the morning is in darkness, and the other half in daylight. Well, the half in daylight goes from first light until about 10 o'clock. Uh, in wolf country, until about 9 o'clock. <laughs> they start heading back to their beds by 9. And most mature whitetails in, in wolf country. But anyway, they're, so they kept feeding here. And I would kind of watch my clock and I wonder when things are going to happen, and I will send Pow! <laughs> One shot. And I was pretty excited. I waited a little bit. Uh, any more shooting? No, no more shooting. Well, Kate was a good Nordberg. Uh, Nordbergs are noted for one-shot kills. And uh, at close range, it's easy to get good. You hit them in vital areas from short distances. In her case, it was probably from 25 yards. How do you miss? <laughs> so anyway, I didn't wait very long. I got my stool, put my stool on my back, you know, and took off and went all the way around here. I got here, and here was tracks of a bounding deer with sprays 
fine sprays and little droplets of blood on both sides each time the trail, the buck hit the ground and said, oh, lung shot. She shot it through the lungs. So the deer's dead. It's over here somewhere. It probably didn't go much further. But it was fine. went that, but with a 30 30, shooting a 30, that happened with my 7 millimeter magnum, they go right down. But the 30 30 isn't quite as devastating as, as the 7 millimeter. But anyway, went back over here, and there she was sitting in her stump, and I walked over, said, Dad, I shot one, but it ran away. <laughs> I heard that before from my daughters, but she stayed put like she was supposed to, and she's, was that ever something? She said, I thought a deer would never came, come. She says, first, I saw, pretty soon I saw a deer, and I saw, and I saw uh, sunlight uh, reflected on that, and I said, oh, here it comes. But she said, I got up here and I could see it was only a forky, and so I let him walk by. He said, I knew you didn't want me to shoot a forky, so I figured there must be something bigger coming. So a little while after that, then I noticed some more motions over down the trail in here, all wooded in here. And I saw some uh, motions there, and pretty soon I could see it was a doe and a fawn, a doe and a fawn coming down the trail, uh, up the trail toward me there. And I let those go by. And I say, oh gee, where's the, where's the big buck I'm supposed to shoot? And pretty soon I saw another movement down there, and I got a little close, I said, oh, it's a big buck, it was a 10 pointer, and a big buck coming. <laughs> and she's, so I didn't dare move for a while because I could figure even way over there, it might spot me moving. And uh, it's amazing, you sit still in a stump like that, so you're, Silhouette is completely enclosed. I mean, it can be wide open in front, but if there, you're, with snow behind you, if your silhouette is not easily spotted, they are, they are, uh, white tails are unlikely to notice you if, as long as you're sitting still. Not only that, uh, white tails can see all colors except colors in the red spectrum. spectrum. So uh, she had blaze orange on, but it's camel blaze orange. Like, as long as you're sitting still. They don't see camel blaze orange, they see that in shades of, of white to black, or gray with little specks and things, like, you know, the camel pattern on it. So, sitting still on a stump, none of those deer noticed her. Well, the deer was about 50 yards away, and it turned to look back. I was probably wondering, you know, making sure nothing was coming. I wasn't coming toward them at that point after the shot, I suppose. And, but it turned to look back, and when it turned to look back uh, in this direction, toward where I was sitting, uh, she got her gun up, so she was ready. Well, it walked up <laughs> right there, 25 yards away, and shot right behind the shoulder, and a little high for a hard shot, but it got both lungs, and that buck took off running <laughs> across the trail. <laughs> and she was kind of worried about it because it ran away. I said, you got the buck. <laughs> Nothing to worry about it. So I took her, we went back, we found it right next to the frozen pond, right about there. There's a beaver house there, and it was right next to the beaver house laying there. Beautiful buck. <laughs> it was exciting. Here, here, take a look at the picture I have here of her with her buck. Here it is, right here. How about that? Now, let me tell you something about the gentle nudge. It works because we use human scent as a, as a fence line to influence deer to go downwind toward the unsmelled hunter up downwind from it. Ordinarily, if I hadn't been sitting there, those deer could have gone any direction. And they, you know, when hunters are on, they kind of like to be going into the wind. And these deer would probably left this area into the wind, and the downwind hunter might not have ever seen those deer, because ordinarily, if there's hunter around, <laughs> they want to be able to smell them, and they're going to go downwind very far. Uh, they might go crosswind and sneak from heavy cover to heavy cover till they finally get to a bedding area where they lay down for the middle of the day. But where would they go upwind in the morning? They got to go downwind to go back to the bedding area. You see, so they have to do that much more carefully and cautiously than they would otherwise. So anyway, by sitting there, it made it. Now, if the deer had been pushed by me. They wouldn't have gone downwind. They expected an ambush. That, that's just automatic in today's mature whitetails. 
that's an ambush down there. Or, or at least they're thinking, I got to go in a direction where I can smell what's ahead of me. So uh, as soon as I get a safe distance downwind, then I'm going to turn right or left and start coursing into the wind. So wherever I'm going, I can smell what's ahead of me and avoid them. So anyway, the best place to do that for them would be to run into the spruce bog. They're safe from any direction when they're in that spruce bog. That wouldn't have worked with the damn Katie would never seen that deer. She saw four deer that morning. Two bucks, one a ten pointer. She wouldn't have seen any of them probably if I tried to drive them in that direction. So what this did is give those deer a chance to decide on their own where they're going. Big bucks, they'll go they'll go only where they want to go. Well in this case, they were free to go wherever they wanted to go, but they wouldn't go upwind because they knew I was over in that area. So they went downwind, probably cautiously like the big buck was looking back, you know, uh, into the wind. Maybe check to see if anything was coming from that way. Going in, downwind, not expecting an ambush because it wasn't being pushed. They could, as long as they could do this on their own volition, they'll go downwind for a ways. And in this case, uh, and this has worked so many times. I, so many big, but my, my youngest son, Ken, has taken five in a row, five years in a row on opening day uh, while we were using a gentle nudge on a doe bedding area. He'd come back to camp at noon and say, uh, Dad, I found some railroad tracks. And the area where he was, there was a feeding area out in front of him, but uh, uh, just south uh, west of that feeding area was a kind of grassy, brushy area where doe, the does that fed in the area always liked to bed. They bed in that same spot. Those five years ago, it might have been the same doe every year. That same doe made it possible to take mature bucks, three of them ending up on the wall, big, nice big bucks, but all mature. I mean, they were eight pointers or better. Uh, from that, at that same site, they'd go in and say, Dad, I saw him found a railroad track. Well, what I would do with the wind right, uh, well, I could go from different directions, but on the other side of the feeding area was a grassy area full of elders, and big, tall grass in there, and little puddles of water here and there. It's next to a, 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 a marsh with a muddy stream going through it, but in that, all that elder brush and deep grass, the dole, that was her favorite. And it was pretty close for a feeding area. A lot of times, uh, a favorite feeding area will be half mile, mile even away from where they their current favorite feeding area is. But in this case, they were close together every year, every time. So whenever he saw any um, rail tracks going and coming from a stand site, that doe and that buck would be in that feeding area other side of that feeding here. That's where they'd be in that deep grass. So one way or another, coming from the north or south, whatever the wind direction happened to be, a uh, straight west wasn't good. If we had a straight west wind, we said, oh, he said, we can't do it with this wind. You know, hopefully it'll still be around tomorrow. If we get a south wind or a northerly wind or even an east wind, which is kind of rare for us, then we could do it. But it seemed like every time so geez, uh one time was from the northwest, uh, all the rest of the time was a southerly wind. So, yeah, Jesus, the wind's just right for it. Uh, I guess we better <laughs> do a gentle nudge over there. And uh, four times <laughs> I was the downwind guy. I get into that marshy area where all the deep grass that were on the, other, on the upwind side of it and uh, sit down. And one time, I got there, and I no sooner got there, and poof, here they go running out of there. Well, I didn't intend for that to happen, but they were bedded so close to where I, a lot closer to that that open marsh with the stream in it than I thought they were. And <coughs> I could see them going, white tails going. And the doe went to the right, and the buck went the other way. And that's not a common tool, and in danger like that, uh, the, the buck will decide where it wants to go because it's, it's the smartest deer in the woods when it comes to avoid, avoiding hunters. So it went to the left, and I, but when they, when they took off, I started counting. One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Pow! <laughs> Can you at it again? It's very it's a high knob on the far side of that feeding area, on the on the north side, actually northwest side. Uh, and from that same stand side on the top of this little high outcropping, he got five bucks in a row, five year, you know, one buck every year for five years from that same spot while we were doing a gentle nudge. Another year we <laughs> we were trying we had another feeding area not too far from there actually, about six blocks probably. That year the favorite feeding area was a bunch of red osiers. Uh, uh, next to a logging trail, one we used to get into our camp, and it was over on the on the west side. And we, the day before, the evening before, we found great big tracks of big buck dragging his hoofs again. <laughs> and we know, and it wasn't with the doe at that point, but there were doe and fawn tracks all over in that feeding area, just all over the place. So we got to camp and said, oh, "Gee, I found a good spot to get a buck in the morning." <laughs> so. We set it up so he was on the downwind side of all that, and an awful trail to get there through. Just terrible elders all laced together, and I went on a, on the opposite side of the road of that old logging trail, and there was a high, um, rocky outcropping on the other side, and all wooded around there. And I went and sat up there and sat back to relax. It was kind of a quiet morning. And uh, all of a sudden I was, hey, the wind is coming toward me, <laughs> right toward me, instead of from the southwest that it had been the evening before, and it was predicted even that in the morning it would be from the southwest. But now it was coming from the north, or from the northeast on my back. And uh, I, all of a sudden I could hear a deer walking on that frozen trail down below that I used to get up there on. The trail I used to get up to was an old deer trail, went up through a lot of brush, and I could I could hear deer walking down there on that hard road. It was frozen. And then prison here comes the fawn and that doe, doe and the fawn, and they were feeding. You can see a red out here here and there and they go over and eat the tips off and they were getting up there and pretty soon they were getting behind me, behind that rock cup, and I was getting worried that they're going to smell me pretty soon and they might start snorting, and if there's a buck following them, then I won't see them. And just about that time I heard more deer, another deer walking, and it, was, and it stopped right down on the, where that old logging trail, uh, where I came up, right on that, next to that trail, and I could, it stopped, and I saw, there's a deer down there, and I'll bet it's the buck, but it wasn't moving. So I, at that, that was early in the years that we hunted there, and, and when a, a grunt call still worked, and I always carried one, and I got it out, and I gave one low grunt. Oh man, that buck just came <laughs> charging up that hillside to where the outcropping stopped 20 feet away, and pow, I got, I shot him. And I couldn't get my favorite neck shot. That was kind of, that drops them in their tracks. I had to go for lungs. And it went about 30 yards and dropped on my right. A great big, the heavy, one of the heaviest bucks I've ever taken. It weighed a 305 pounds live, dressing out about 243. Big, big eight pointer. <laughs> really nice buck. So in that, t in that case, the general nudge got turned around by a changing wind direction. But gosh, that, that we've taken quite a few bucks using that. What a great hunting method that is. But we only use it when we know where a big buck's going to be uh, before we set up the hunt. Anytime we, we say, oh, he's going to be in that feeding area, he's going to be in that bedding area, boy, we'll set one up right away. But otherwise, uh, we don't use that hunting method randomly in the woods. I mean, it sometimes happens that one of us stand hunters is upwind of another stand hunter downwind, and a buck walks in between us and says, oh, there's a stand hunter over there, I think it'll go south or north or whatever, downwind from here, and runs into the other hunter. So sometimes we get, one of the other hunters gets a deer that way. But the gentle, and you see why we call it a gentle nudge? It's just, we aren't forcing the deer 
or just give them a gentle nudge in the direction we wanted to go, not not a, an aggressive thing, so that the buck itself can make the decision that it's going to go that way. If you force them, they ain't going to go that way, not very far. So this gentle nudge thing just kind of gives them the idea that I they don't want to go up there where that hunter is. I'm going to go this way instead for a little bit. And they run into the downwind hunter, which they can't smell and haven't heard or seen moving. So it's a great hunting method. Using scents, in this case, using human scent to, to set up a, 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 a successful buck harvest like that. So easy to do, but you know, it's important that both the upwind hunter and the down hunter, wind hunter, knows where they're going in the dark. Or if midday, you can see where you're going, but you got to know where to go. You, and you got to do it in the way that the when the upwind hunter, especially, uh, you don't you they, you don't want them to know you're near until they can smell you walking laterally, not toward them, but from left to right or right to left, 100 yards or more north uh, uh, upwind of them. And uh, then when you stop, then they don't. Oh, they, they won't run right away because uh, you're not heading toward them. And then when you stop and sit, they won't run because uh, they they know you're safe. You're not moving. And so allow the deer to make the decision to go downwind, not you f try to force them to move downwind. And it works. So good idea, guys. Uh, keep this hunting method in your pocket anytime you get a chance to use it. You're gonna, it just works so well. Sometimes we'll get the buck right away, as we did that one year that I had, I got too close to those bedded deer. But most of the time it can take anywhere from, uh, oh, one to four hours, might be four hours before they're done feeding, or it's time to get up from bed and let's go to a feeding area in the afternoon. It might take that long before the downwind hunter sees the deer. But it works for dark I want. If you get too many hunters involved, like downwinders, that are making a lot, the more chances you are, there is, that the bed of deer in the, in the bedding area are going to hear that hunter. See, there's something down there and he's sure breaking a lot of branches, or maybe see him, use a spot, oh, that's a human. Uh, the more hunters you got involved, the less likely it's going to work. It works just great for two hunters that absolutely know where to go. And, and it works great, it works almost 100% when you know a big buck is in a certain spot and the wind is right and that sort of thing. Boy, does it work good then. So, gentle knives. Use that as one of your favorite ways to hunt deer under those circumstances. And keep in mind those railroad tracks, that's a good opening sign to start using a gentle knife. So, there you go. Now I've got some more. I got another way um, to uh, take advantage of how scents affect whitetails uh, to hunt big bucks. Uh, it's one hunters have been using forever, uh, using uh, doe and estrus lure scents. Nowadays, most mature does, those that are uh, two and a half years of age or older, even better if they're three and a half years or old, every doe uh, <coughs> uh, recognizes hunters by their, by their sense, trail scent and uh, uh, airborne scent uh, very easily and bucks is all older bucks, uh, two and a half years of age or older as well. And uh, generally today, you know, back when I First start, when I, I put together a 12-hour video series called White Tail Hunters World back in the middle 80s, 1985 1986. And uh, we had a lot of really nice bucks in that video. And 90%, at least that, of all the bucks we photographed were there because they were smelling dough and estrus lorset that we were using. It worked so good back in those days. It was crazy. You guys could tie a rag with some of that on a string and drag it to it. Well, they were going to a stand site, and then pretty soon here comes a buck along their back trail following that. They were kind of crazy. 
they didn't pay attention to any human sense that it might have been accompanying those sense providers that doing this to strike lure said, Well, it's not that way today. After all these decades of using it, uh, uh, doing estrus lure sand isn't near as effective for taking older bucks than it used to be. But there's a way you can do it <laughs> so it's almost as good. You're just going to see a lot more mature bucks using this set, using this particular hunting method. And, uh, and I'll tell you all about it during my next YouTube presentation. So I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Well, goodbye for now and good luck. Ha, ha, ha.